Our moans and his moans. It's all about the same thing. So I want to introduce you to a small part of your brain called the pituitary gland. And this, if you want to believe in evolution, then this is what we call your primal brain. This is the very beginning of it. Every, every creature that exists has this. It's where we think your brain started. A lot of your very basic instinctive processes come from here. The breathing instincts, the animals that know when they are born, they must walk, they must eat, they must drink this way, they must lift their legs to wheel so it doesn't go on their foot. Nobody ever told your dog that. He just knows. And you kick him a few times and he remembers. <laughs> Don't we on your foot? Have you got a dog like that? Uh, so, uh, I want to introduce you to what this little uh, part of your brain does. So I'll show you this just to show you how tiny it is. Hey, size of a pea, right in the middle of your brain. It's the reason you sometimes, when you have sinusitis, will get headaches too, because of the pressure in this little sinus that sits right next to it called your sphenoid sinus. Okay, so uh, this also communicates with higher parts of your brain called your thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary. You don't have to remember that. But there, after 12 weeks of this course, there will be an exam, and you can practice medicine. <laughs> so, we, I only practice anyway, remember. I've never actually worked a day in my life. So this little hormone, uh, hormone machine, this little part of your brain makes the chemicals that control the rest of your body. And I just want to run through them to show you how important it is. And you might, I don't know if you wonder anymore when you come to these lectures, like what has this got to do with weight loss? Are you all here like waiting for that tip, the tip for the night this week, lose three kilograms and do, I don't do that. So what, the energy, if your energy is working, if your body knows how to switch off at night to sleep and on again in the day, if it knows how to make the thyroid work and the adrenal glands work and the ovaries work and the testicles work to balance your system, then weight loss comes free of charge. That's the whole theme of Better Life. You guys got that by now. So what does this little thing do? It's got an anterior part, a front part, and a back part. So the front part makes all these different things. Now this one, ladies and gentlemen, is the wonder of our time, growth hormone. It's the thing that made you grow up when you were picky. It starts settling down somewhere between 18 and 23. So a boy can continue to grow up until 23 years old. Uh, it makes your bones long, it makes your muscles long and strong. The problem with it is in some of us, Later on, it keeps your muscles strong and it keeps your muscle tone high, but it needs to be stimulated to be secreted. If your body's secretion of growth hormone goes down, your energy efficiency goes down. Your muscles become lazier. They, they don't have a nice tone. They can be mushy. They don't, they're not nice and hard. Have you ever touched a 20-year-old's muscle? Like, whoa. <laughs> Did you see how far that went down when I did it? And I was really pulling. <laughs> anyway, so what happens is that it keeps you strong and it maintains tone. If you've got good tone, you've got good production of other hormones, chemicals in your body, and it helps you to burn fat or assist your body with the decision of how much fat does this body need? What's the body fat percentage required to function normally? So when it's very low, a lot of fat. When it's very high, a lot of muscle. So that's why these kids, you've seen children, what do we, how often do you say these 17 year olds, they're tall and thin, they're strong, they fit, but they're just skinny, no, but they can go for days. Then later on, they, we settle out, which is a good thing, because you don't want to look 16 for the rest of your life. Um, but it's the reason none of you can fit in your wedding dresses anymore, I'm afraid. Okay, you can thank growth hormone. I wanted to actually tell you something interesting that I mentioned to a patient and I thought actually I've never said that to you guys. Do you know that when you diet and when you exercise, you don't lose weight because you are burning fat? Do you know that you cannot actually control fat at all? Nothing, nothing you do, this is going to be a great evening, nothing you do will make you lose fat. The decision to lose fat is controlled by the brain. As the brain is satisfied with its environment, it switches on chemicals which allow your body to make the decision to no longer have to store that much fat 
or to store that reserve or to burn a certain amount of energy per minute, per hour, per day. It's a chemical change. It's got nothing to do with food. It's got nothing to do with exercise. It's a chemical change. If the chemicals don't change, you get fat when you drink water. Okay? The chemicals, one of them is this, growth hormone. If growth hormone is not stimulated, you can try and try and try. Your weight loss will go to a point and it will stop. How do you stimulate it? Interestingly enough, uh, the two muscles in your body that are the most sensitive growth hormone stimulators are your biceps and your quadriceps, these two muscles. So probably the two best exercises you could do are squats and curls of sorts. So for the ladies, just normally washing dishes is fine. <laughs> Uh, that's so funny. <coughs> Don't worry, we delete a lot of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's going to create so much trouble at home now. <laughs> so, but that's how you build these muscles. These, these two muscles, for some reason, stimulate testosterone and stimulate um, growth hormone, which are two very important hormones to burn fat. So you can often tell if somebody's using testosterone to build, they have certain muscles that are testosterone sensitive. So when somebody's got big muscles here by the neck, they've used steroids to grow. When they've got overly big pecs, imbalanced muscles, specifically big arms. You know those guys whose arms are bigger than their waist, a thin little waist and big arms? That's what steroids does to you. Somebody who's gymming and exercising normally will never grow disproportionately like that. So the, the Rock, we all know The Rock, the actor, a wrestler, that is a steroid build, unfortunately. <coughs> it doesn't look all bad, and he, he was one of the fortunate ones that actually did it fairly proportionately. But you, you, you're not going to do that naturally. Uh, the adrenal cortex one, so you've got a thing here called adrenocorticotrophic hormone. You just have to remember that, please, for the test afterwards. And this basically communicates with the gland sitting on top of your kidney called your adrenal gland. It decides how much energy your body needs to function through the day. It decides if you wake up in the morning and if you get tired just before bedtime when you want to fall asleep. If it doesn't work properly, you feel anxious, you can have palpitations, your blood pressure can go up, your sugar can go up, your body becomes insulin resistant, diabetic down the road. But people who've got mood disorders, anxiety disorders, sleep disorders, this is often the problem, is an overstimulation of that. And we talked a little bit last week about the giraffe in the tree. Stimulated. You wish you were here if you've missed that, hey? Yes, giraffe in a tree. But I took that picture. So <laughs> the, <laughs> I did, I took it off the internet. So the thing is, this adrenal cortex determines a lot about uh, blood pressure control, heart rate, breathing, sleep, stress, and ultimately weight loss. That's why calmness, parasympathetic control, we talked about last week, lose weight. That's why when people exercise too much, they don't necessarily lose weight because they're actually stressing a system that's not functioning well, so exercise can have the opposite effect to what you want. The thyroid is stimulated by a gland. If your thyroid doesn't work well, we'll touch on thyroid a bit later, Thyroid must work well to lose weight, but once it's been out of control too long, it is very hard to reverse the effects of the, of the high thyroid, or ugh, the low thyroid. But it's controlled by this little part of your brain. Maybe, uh, so every, every chemical name that you see here is going out into the blood and stimulating the organ somewhere else in the body. This organ is found here in the neck. Testicles, I'm not gonna point it, you can imagine. So, uh, I was just getting onto a very, so that one's yeah, and this one's yeah, and then there's um, the skin. So the ovaries and the testicles are controlled by the brain. So how much uh, sperm is produced, how the volume, health, motility, ovulation, f all the fertility in women and in men is determined not by the end organ, the end organ is the part that's at the end, but by the central organ, the pituitary gland, the body will decide if the environment is safe enough to reproduce. So how do some people make babies? By not worrying and obsessing about making babies. 
Do, do you all know somebody who adopted a child and then fell pregnant just after? We've all heard that story. Why? Because they stopped stressing about it. So um, that, that has to do with this control of the brain and how things happen there. The skin, the color of your skin, there's a very nice product on the market, um, which we can get in South Africa now, called Melanotan. You can speak to me afterwards. There's an actor whose name's not coming to me. Uh, he's kind of a surfer boy actor. He lost a lot of weight in a very short time and he's very brown. McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey. Did you ever notice how tanned he looks? and skinny. So melanotan people burns fat with one unfortunate side effect. You go a little brown. And that's not too unfortunate because you can look just nicely tanned. But if a thing was a little brown, then it goes very brown. So if you start a little brown, you can go black. <laughs> so maybe not for everybody, it depends where you are, okay? but. It works like a bomb and it works for, and here's the other problem, it works for a year, the effect of it. Irreversible. So we have it. We inject it. I don't. You can tell by my pale skin. I haven't used it on anybody. I know it exists. It's hard to get, but um, it does work amazingly, and it's all because of a stimulation. We're actually not even sure how it works, but it works by stimulating something in the pituitary gland and as part of that the body secretes more pigment that makes your skin darker. So just interestingly enough the the amount that you tan when you lay in the sun is a decision made by your brain. So children that are sensitive to the sun can be fixed. Did you ever, um, did, there was a tablet called Silver Sun. You, okay, and, and just so you know, a little bit of marketing, we have a tablet similar to Silver Sun now. So you take a tablet and you don't burn in the sun. But you know what? You do burn. You just don't, uh, you don't burn sore and you don't necessarily tan afterwards. So it was called a sunscreen that you swallow. So how on earth does that work? So when you sit in the sun, what happens is you burn. But if you've ever burnt, have you noticed that when you push on the burn, it goes white? So it goes white or pale because it's not actually a burn. It's blood coming up to the surface. That's what your initial burn is. That's why you feel so hot when you've burnt in the sun. Then two or three or four days later, your skin color darkens because once your body's exposed to that sunlight and has been hurt, it responds by covering the little cells in your skin with a little pigment layer, which we call melanin, and that makes you go browner in the sun. A decision controlled by your brain, not your skin. You actually, nothing actually happens here when you burn. It's a blood reaction, and I can stop that with a pill, which eventually went off the market. But now there's a company that imports something very similar that works for two to three hours. So perfect for a guy who wants to go and play a game of golf and doesn't feel like smearing himself. Nice, except that you're sort of not aware of the damage that you're doing to yourself while you're out there. But also nice, um, I have the personal opinion that part of the reason we have a lot of vitamin D deficiency, which leads to osteoporosis, which leads to hip fractures and death, is because we've been now told that sun is poisonous, dangerous. We're also scared of kin ca skin cancer. We rather die of fractured hips and backs. And our thyroids don't work properly because of sun tan lotions. So we've just chosen a more expensive way to die. Uh, so I don't believe in sun tan lotions, excessive use of sun tan lotion. Your body needs to be exposed to the unfiltered rays of the sun at least 15, 20 minutes, at least three to four times a week, at least more than 20% of your body surface. That means not just your arms or your face, but your legs, your bikini body. So the best is to lie on a sort of a rotisserie and just, <laughs> they should totally invent that. Hey, how come we don't have that yet? The human rotate. 
Yeah, okay, there we go. We, at your gym, you might find a machine. Do you have to turn in it, or does it turn you? No, you have to turn it. Okay. So you can tell by my pale skin, I've never done that either. But yes, they've invented beds you can lie in, I suppose. But I suppose nobody likes the sharp spike going up inside. That, that's the hard part. Prolactin <laughs> is... Uh, Prolactin is a chemical secreted by your brain. When you breastfeed, it helps your body produce milk. Men, interestingly enough, also have this hormone. But you will have noticed that you very seldom see men breastfeeding. And, when, and I use seldom in the very loosest sense of the word, like never. So why do we have prolactin? We don't know what prolactin does in men, but we have it. So we do know that when prolactin goes up, it causes breast cancer and it suppresses or lowers testosterone. So when you come to me with erection problems, one of the things that I test is prolactin in men. And nine out of 10 of those men have a tumor in this part of the pituitary, which is overproducing this chemical, which is weird considering we have absolutely no use for it, but it causes big problems. Sometimes, interestingly enough, prolactin gets stimulated we know that increased prolactin causes tenderness of a breast or a discharge from a breast. But interestingly enough, it works backwards. You can stimulate a breast, and that stimulates the production of prolactin. So that's why the mother's milk is secreted. When the baby latches, it stimulates the production of milk. But, mothers, you may or may not remember that you can produce breast milk even when your baby cries. So what's that about? That's because your brain decides how much breast milk to make. Not your breasts, not your baby, not your food, not your drugs, your brain. And you can literally recognize your baby's breath and signals will come from higher up in your brain and say, it's time to feed the baby. Yeah, so very cute how your body works, eh? Then we have oxytocin. Oxytocin is a very cool uh, hormone. So oxytocin has one major function. It makes the womb contract so that you can have babies. Again, men very seldom have need for that. But we have oxytocin. So what else could oxytocin possibly do? We know that oxytocin is also secreted when the breasts are stimulated. So let me go through a very questionable phase of our program as I describe to you what oxytocin does. So, how do I stimulate the, the secretion of oxytocin in a human being? One, stimulate the nipple. Two, look at a nipple. How many of you have met a man, say, ever, who didn't like a woman's breasts? And I'm not talking about the weird ones, the normal ones. There's a weird sort of attraction to a woman's breasts. Women are very... Why is a mastectomy like the biggest and worst thing that could happen to a woman? It's just a chunk of fat with a little nipple on top. So, but why is that like uh, momentously huge? We attach a lot of value to the breast, both men and women. Um, why does a man always try and look down a woman's shirt when she bends forward? Well, we don't. Apparently, you guys do too. My wife let me off that one. <coughs> But what's up with that thing? What's the attraction to these little lumps? Well, one of them is the secretion of this chemical. The other way that you secrete it is by drawing somebody close and squeezing them against you, like when somebody's sad or crying, or when you just love somebody, you want to squeeze them. You notice that's very seldom a dricky. Not so much love there. That's what you do to people you don't like. Um, or your patients sometimes in case it gets confusing. I, I do side drinkies. <laughs> because I don't need oxytocin in that room, you understand. Next thing people are going, nipple out. <laughs> Want to see mine? <laughs> so, <laughs> squeezing against each other for more than 10 seconds, oxytocin secretion. It creates a bond, a feeling, something warm, something really intense. It's the reason a mother bonds with a baby in a way that a father never will. Is not only because she breastfed, but she's held it close to her chest and squeezed. And the baby is feeling the heartbeat and this oxytocin. So some people call it the love hormone. 
So we now know that a woman who's got a poor libido or who never feels sexually stimulated, uh, even by her body, her husband's 55-year-old body that he still thinks looks like it did 40 years ago, we can give you oxytocin. There is hope for you. It's almost like a blindfold with a picture of Brad Pitt on the inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> what essentially is happening is I can give you this thing. <laughs> I can give it to you like a, in a lollipop form. <laughs> I never made that connection before. <laughs> uh, so much of editing tonight. I hope you... Yes, I suppose I can see how that works. And then I could give it to you in a, there's a, a, a thing called a, I'm never sure of this pronunciation, troch or troche. It's a tablet that just dissolves in your tongue. And uh, there's a spray version and there's a tablet version. But they don't work as well as the sprays and this thing that dissolves in your tongue. So it actually needs to be absorbed from your mouth. And it almost, it probably has to do with something with a direct connection. But it can actually make you feel stimulated and warm and loving and affectionate. This little chemical. So don't worry if you didn't give normal birth, you haven't missed your chance to use your oxytocin. <laughs> oh, the other way it can be stimulated by the nipple, by touching of the nipple. That's why I mean, go for the nipples first. Go for the nipples. <laughs> We, now remember this, we can't help it, okay? <laughs> Nobody told me that. My higher brain, my primitive brain said, go for the nipples. <laughs> okay. And the last one is really exciting. It controls blood pressure. I know you always wonder, like, what does your wife think about it when you talk like this? Well, firstly, she's heard all of this stuff. And a lot of these bruises are where I get slapped. <laughs> 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 when, when, I, when I exercise my own talks. <clears throat> but I told them, lovey, what we're going to do. Anyway, uh, moving right along. So, let's, so that's an exciting part of your brain, isn't it? And it's the size of a pea, and it makes everything that you thought you can control seem a little bit out of your control. You can do nothing about any of those things. They are there, and they're controlling you. They're making you happy, they're making you sad. They're making you energetic, they're making you tired, they're making you uh, digest your food properly, pass your food properly. If your thyroid doesn't work properly, you can be constipated. What? That little pee can decide if you poo. <laughs> poo jokes are funny normally. Okay, well, I get we're coming out of a sexual thing now. So. <laughs> it, the comparison is just not there. So, but this little thing. So when I fix your thyroid, you know what one of the first things people say to me is, I can go to the toilet again. Wow, what's the connection? It's the fiber in the tablet. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's really not. Okay. Ask your question. Yes, absolutely. So the problem with oxytocin in the use of depression is that it has what we call a short half-life. So it only works for a half an hour to an hour. So we, we can't get slow release versions of it. And there's no trials. There's, there are one or two people that claim to treat depression with it. But you literally have to take the tablet four times a day, which makes you depressed. So <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't done well, and it's very expensive. Uh, so there are these people that use it. I've tried it on a few patients. Um, but in South Africa, we can only get a tablet form of it. And it really just doesn't, uh, let's just say nobody came back for more. So it just didn't work. I just said, just rubber nipples. OK. <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd try it again, see if I could squeeze one more laugh out. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not desperate for laughs. Thank you for being here. Same place next week. So let's move through the system. We talk about this system, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pineal. The pineal makes something called melatonin, which makes you sleep. If you don't have melatonin, you can't sleep. Unfortunately, giving you melatonin doesn't always make you sleep. But it does for many people, specifically young children, middle, uh, middle women, middle-aged women. So from about your 50s, Melatonin does work very well. It doesn't work well for the gap between, say, 15 years old to 50 years old. It's not normally a partly because it's not a melatonin problem. 
but in your 50 plus, and you, you know these people, this is your granny that gets up at three o'clock in the morning to make tea. No? This is your baby that wakes up at half past four in the morning and wants to play or watch Barney again. So, pineal gland. I had a man yesterday who has this story. He's very overweight. He, his libido is good. His energy is not too bad, but he has slumps in the day. So he wakes up early, 4.30. He's got a truck business. And he doesn't need to eat when he wakes up. Somewhere around midday, he starts to feel hungry for the first time. But he also has an energy dip that lasts three to four hours. He's really tired. After that, he feels really good for another three to four hours. Then he has a bit of a dip again. He doesn't exercise at all. So he doesn't eat a lot. He doesn't feel like he ever needs to sleep more than four hours, but he's very overweight. He swears to me he doesn't eat wrong. He lies. <laughs> but what he's, not what he's not noticing is that when he does eat, he's probably eating big portions. So he's not eating often in the day, but when he's eating, he's eating a lot. He's catching up. But his body has learned to store the food from that one big meal. But he has a problem. We talk about a circadian rhythm problem. His clock is not set properly. So he sleeps four or five hours because his body doesn't actually want to sleep. But when it comes to 12 o'clock in the afternoon, if you had a bed for him there, he would sleep because his body is eight to 12 hours out of sync with what's happening. So he's awake at night, actually, and he's asleep during the day. So he's not hungry at the right times, but his body stopped burning energy. And his problem is that his adrenal uh, uh, glands are not being stimulated to produce cortisol in the morning that's supposed to make you feel awake, and they're not stimulated to produce melatonin at night to make him fall asleep. So that's how I fix him. I don't change, oh, he needs Coke all day long, one, two, three, four liters of Coke to survive. So he doesn't drink coffee, because that's bad for you. <laughs> And, and he's not really ever thirsty, let's be honest, because there's a lot of Coke to get through. But his Coke basically is stimulant. But he'll drink a glass of Coke and go to bed. So he hasn't made that connection either between, but I don't sleep well, but I don't feel like I need to sleep. I don't really want to sleep. I'm actually going to bed and I'm just starting to feel good because he's out of sync, remember? So how do I change this guy? Firstly, I tell him you can have Coke, but you can only have it within three hours of getting up. Because caffeine and sugar stimulates cortisol production. In other words, it will help him go, this is time to wake up. But as the day goes on, he can't have it anymore. So I want him to have a little spike, and then I want the level of this cortisol to go down. Then I give him melatonin to go to bed. He has to go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time every morning. So I'm gonna start slowly trying to turn his clock. He's gotta get up in the morning, he's gotta do 10 push-ups and 10 sit-ups, stare at a bright light, and have a cold shower. So his body goes, what? I was sleeping. <laughs> okay? That's normally what your wife does when you switch the light on. No, that's normally what I do. Let's make some stuff about me. That's what we do. So it's a little bit of like, um, it's that shock that you have in the morning. So you know a lot of us that say, I never feel like breakfast in the morning. Do you know why you sometimes don't feel like breakfast in the morning? Because you're not awake yet. Your brain, your eyes are open, but that's not the same. And I've spoken to you, some of you when that's happening, and you can see, ooh, the, the lights are on, but nobody's home. You know that thing? So some people are like that the rest of the day. But uh, some people, how do you know when you're waking up? The first time you start to get hungry in the day is probably when you're waking up. And for a lot of us, that's 10, 11. Now, remember, we also talked about that thing about when you eat assimilation, appropriation, elimination, the three phases that your body goes through through the day. So it's not an accident that you come, you're starting to wake up at the end of the elimination phase. So when people tell me they're not hungry in the morning, they don't really feel like they need a lot of sleep, they're struggling with their weight, but they don't eat a lot of food, you're dealing with a system that just doesn't have a concept of its time anymore. So eating, and here's another weird one. If I want his cortisol to be high in the morning, I make him eat carbohydrate before he goes to bed. So this is based on a study that was done last year. Uh, we've kind of always known this, but then you get banting, paleo. Everybody hates carbohydrates. There's like a flag and a song about it. Hey? But we found that when you give somebody a carbohydrate before they go to bed, 
their cortisol levels rise higher the following morning when they wake up. You feel more awake more quickly. Do you know why? Partly because when you've eaten that last little bit of carbohydrate, your body doesn't have to worry about energy production overnight. It literally burns up that little bit of carbohydrate. So it controls the sugar. It makes the liver work a bit better. And for some reason, it affects your adrenal glands to make that little bit of cortisol. You feel, so try it, those of you that feel like I don't wake up in the morning, which is very anti your diet, I know. But remember, we're not only dealing with a food problem. We're dealing with an energy problem. If you're always tired, you're not going to lose weight. If you don't sleep properly, you're not going to lose weight. If you stay depressed and you're not sleeping properly, guess which problem I'm going to focus on? Your sleep. Because you must sleep. And if you're sleeping with a tablet, it's not real sleep. So we want to try and sleep normal. Let's try and get through the rest of these things. Um, oh, we haven't got a lot of time left. So, so ladies, you might recognize this. This is called your period. How many of you have noticed that a woman's period is the same as the cycles of the moon? 28 days, full moon to full moon. That's why we turn into werewolves when there's a full moon. Oh, it's time again. Anyway, <coughs> that's when the men get thrown out of the house. Drop a biki, there's my afviak. So it's an interesting uh, thing that your cycles have adapted exactly to the cycles of the moon, 28 day cycle. I will even use the, the moon when people use hormones and they must use it for two weeks on or two weeks off. Then I'll tell them, set it, when you see the full moon, use it for two weeks. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about your periods. There's a lot of stories about that. Ladies, just very briefly, men you can follow because it'll help you understand your woman. Uh, just this middle part's important. Uh, actually, they're all important. So let's do this purple line first. Estrogen. Your ovaries make estrogen. In the beginning, this is your 28-day cycle. This is the middle of that cycle, day 14. You have a peak of this estrogen. That's when you ovulate. That's when you're fertile. Make a babies. Also, you should feel good. Also, you should feel sexually more attractive and your libido should be better. If you don't, then one has to wonder if you have an ovulation at all. Interestingly enough, you'll see the red line spikes at the same time. This is called luteinizing hormone. It's the pituitary gland that has given instruction to the ovary to let the egg out, so ovulate. A lot of women do a test. I don't know if you've heard of a clear blue test. It's a cycle tester to see if you've ovulated. It tests this hormone. But when we go and look, there's no egg. So some women have a cycle, but it's not synchronized. They have the spike, but they don't have the egg. They have the egg, but they don't have the spike. Those people struggle with fertility. So when I try to help you fall pregnant, I try to get these lines all to match up. The second line that's important, so estrogen goes up in the middle. See, the green line is not even there at the beginning. The green line's progesterone. I'll tell you none of what the progesterone's for. This is a very, very important hormone to keep you calm and help you lose weight. So estrogen is very energizing, but it can come very irritating. Women who've got very high estrogen, you know who you are because you you're very irritable, you're prone to migraines, you swell, you bloat, you have a lot of breast tenderness before your periods. You have heavy periods, you end up with hysterectomies. You guys have high estrogens and you don't have a balance of the second hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is the thing that you make when you ovulate, when the egg comes out. So if the egg's there, you don't make it. When the egg's out, you make it. So women have got something called polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. They have a problem because they don't make progesterone. It's very difficult to fix. I can give you progesterone, but it's hard to make, give a woman a medicine that works like that because you'd have to use, if it was a tablet, one today, two tomorrow, three, four, five, then on day 21, come down again. It's very, very hard to duplicate a wave with medicine. We do try sometimes, but it's invariably impossible. I tell you this because I just want you to recognize what's happening to you that week before your period and why you struggle to lose weight at that time. You know this, the, the ladies. Why are your periods really hard to lose weight? Energy production, increased energy, is estrogen. Calmness, good sleep, weight loss, parasympathetic is progesterone based. So a woman that's ovulating normally tends to be the calmer, more controlled woman and has more control over her weight. Women that don't ovulate put on weight very, very easily. When you go into menopause, these lines flatten out. 
then you become more like a man. So nothing changes from one day to the next. All right, so I've told you a little bit, what, what do we call these things? Progesterone deficiencies. When you don't have them, you might have heard of PMS. Okay, this is a, a very broad term that we use for a woman that's grumpy just before her period. Every single woman seems to suffer from it one way or another. The symptoms aren't all the same, but some women get it very severely. As in, I have women who see me that say, I feel like I have PMS for three weeks out of the month. My breasts are too sore to touch. My, I feel bloated. My bowels don't work. I have headaches, migraines, migraines. I just want to say migraines. If you get migraines, a lot of migraines are because of this problem, PMS. I don't know how many of you have heard this term, PMDD. It's a newer term that's uh, popped out. And it's, you will, for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, so try to remember that, but otherwise just remember PMDD. If you heard that word, it's the same thing, but it's women that are actually, it's not PMS. PMS just describes I'm grumpy and I'm happy and I'm irritable before my period. PMDD is actually a syndrome of progesterone deficiency. So it's a bigger problem that needs to be helped or supplemented. You will struggle to lose weight. The worse your PMS, the more I know there's a hormone balance or cycle problem that will affect your weight. How do you know? Breast tenderness, migraines, bad skin. Oh, the girls with acne. The girls with hairs growing under their chins. When you walk into my room, I know when I see you that this is the problem. Progesterone. You're not ovulating. You're not ovulating every month or one of your ovaries is not ovulating. The ladies that come in and say, oh, I had a hysterectomy when I was 35. You probably didn't have progesterone way back then already. And if you'd had progesterone, you wouldn't have needed your, your hysterectomy. Uh, I have put a slide in just to kind of sum up what some of the signs are. So if you want to go and look at it later, what are the symptoms of low progesterone or not ovulating? And then here, here is the more important one, insulin resistance. So why do ladies who have this problem have a problem with weight loss? Because your sugar doesn't work properly, your insulin doesn't work properly. It's a very, uh, the condition goes hand in hand. That's why a lot of women with this get put on sugar therapies, glucophage. It's a treatment we use in polycystic ovaries. It's a hormone problem that becomes a food and energy production problem. A lot of ladies have this, especially your younger ladies that struggle to lose weight. Um, Weight gain, the hot flushes you can have even as a young woman. Weight around the midriff. This tube that you get is related to this progesterone thing. So my treatment for women, hormone replacement therapy. When you post-menopausal 50 plus, the treatment is combinations of estrogen and progesterone. When you're 40 to 50, that's a very dark time for a lot of women because you are irritable and grumpy. Your kids are teenagers, so I mean, you're just angry all the time anyway. And you don't ovulate every month, so you don't have the calming effect of the progesterone. So this is a wild time. This is when the husband gets moaned at for nothing. Well, I mean, he always does something, eh? But I mean, he's so nice. Men are generally so perfect. And then the woman just get angry with us. So what happens is, this is all true. Um, tiredness and chronic fatigue. I'm always tired. So, Woman 40 to 50, I give you progesterone. Very hard though to get the balance. I've been doing it for years and it is really difficult. But it's an interesting treatment. It's quite a new therapy that interestingly enough, the gynees don't acknowledge at all. It certainly doesn't work for everybody, but those for whom it works, it works wonderfully, life-changing, specifically the ladies with the migraines and the weight. Um, all right, I wanted to also talk about these conditions, endometriosis, infertility, polycystic ovaries. These ladies, you often have problems of too much estrogen and too little progesterone. So if you've been to a doctor for one of these things, then you have a problem with the hormone balance. You will also have problems with weight and energy, and they can be solved. Something often causes this, and this is often tied into your thyroid, it's often connected to toxicities, mercury toxicity, we know. So your, your fillings in your mouth can cause infertility. So I can help a woman fall pregnant just by giving her zinc and taking her fillings out. So try IVF, 45,000 Rand, take out her fillings and give her zinc. 
I wish it worked for everybody, but it certainly does work for some. Menopause, this is a shocking time of your life, and, I'm, and, and you know, that's just how your husband's seeing it, but just when you thought you knew yourself, you ran out of estrogen. So you go through your wild 40s, which is all over the place, and then suddenly you just want to die. So in, in the 40s, you want to kill your husband. Maybe in the 50s, you've given up, and you just want to die. So depression is a problem. Here's the things that happen to menopause ladies. Try and catch some of these things. The weight gain around the middle, flushes, sweats, disturbed sleep, vaginal dryness, lots of bladder infections, leaky bladders. Do you know that your bladder leaks not because it's too full or you don't get to the toilet enough? It leaks because estrogen keeps it strong. And when your estrogen's down, the muscle's weak. So I can keep your bladder stronger by giving you estrogen. So you never have to leak. Loss of sexual desire or libido. I see this every day. I've started one day if anybody out there is having sex because the woman don't want nothing. So you get the different versions of it. No, I wish I could but I don't. No, I never do. No, and I really don't even want to. I've seen the whole spectrum. Don't make that come back again. How about, it was really cool, my woman's big if law peace with law smile. <coughs> Depressions. You know what? I see a lot of women who end up at a psychiatrist, and it's actually the beginning of menopause. Your memory. I start a sentence and get interrupted. Uh, what are we talking about again? That's when you find out, A, that you're being interrupted, B, that you're really boring, and C, nobody was listening. Isn't, have you noticed that thing that happens? What was I talking about? Anybody? No? Yeah. Did anybody actually notice if I left the room now? So, uh, this is also when you walk into a room and you can't remember what you walked into the room for. Okay. This isn't quite when you put the car keys in the fridge, but that happens too. It also happens when you met the guy this morning, and I can't remember his name. What's that? Um, that uh, this, it's on the tip of my tongue, man. What's that guy? It can just be your hormones. I can fix that. Breast changes, yes, they sag even more when you thought they can't be. This must be the bottom, but no. <laughs> They can go more, because now they start to stretch, which is especially special. Um, thinner skin, less moisture in your skin, drier skin. Your bones now start to weaken because estrogen uh, receptors can be found in your bones, and they actually control the flow of calcium in and out of your bones. So how I give estrogen to women uh, interestingly enough, progesterone as well. So a lot of doctors in the past who did hysterectomies didn't give women estrogen. We now know that those women end up with problems with their bone because it was progesterone that was stimulating the bones to grow stronger. So we, functional doctors, we give progesterone and estrogen to all our menopausal women. Doesn't matter what operations you had. Here's another one. The cholesterol levels were going up. I should have put in, I meant to put on the thyroid. So if you've been to your doctor, your thyroid's going down, your cholesterol's going up, your blood pressure's going up, your weight's going up, your mood's going down. Then you have menopause. You don't have a disease. Something's changing. Uh, these are some of the things that I think you know them. Tiredness, uh, can't sleep. Yeah, that woman's in menopause. Not interested in your husband. Cry for no reason at all. I feel better when I've had a good cry. What did you cry about? Because I didn't cry earlier. <laughs> I just need it. Not knowing what's going on. You start to feel and look doff. It's not a nice feeling for a woman. I see this a lot too. And it's very debilitating because you are a woman in her late 40s, early 50s. You're often in managerial controlling positions and you feel doff. And you're kind of hoping nobody notices. But they kind of do but they kind of don't tell you because they know they'll get their heads ripped off. <laughs> so it's not a nice position for anybody to be in. And, and I know a lot of ladies will come to me because in the board meetings, they'll start to sweat. And it's embarrassing. It shouldn't be embarrassing because it's like life. But it's, I suppose it's like farting in, in the boardroom as well. It's natural. It's just not cool. So 
for the boys, I've added a little section, because this is how we obviously see ourselves forever. Uh, we make this little hormone. Now, ladies, you have this hormone too. You've got one-tenth of the amount that I have. So why do you need testosterone? Because testosterone's major role is the production of sperm. So very seldom has a woman ever needed it for that purpose. <laughs> Interesting thing about uh, the testosterone, it also makes the man stand erect. Erections are testosterone related. But by the time the goods don't work, it's already too late. Unfortunately, speaking from a medical perspective, the erection problem is the last problem, not the first problem. If it was the first problem, we would see men in their 30s and 40s. We would cure diabetes. We would cure high blood pressure. There would be no stress. There would be no heart attacks because the, the thing that precedes heart attacks often is erectile dysfunction, blood flow to the penis. But unfortunately, it comes to, towards end. A diabetic can be a diabetic for many years before he starts to have problems with this. Um, but it's the diabetes that caused it. But if we actually had seen this first, he would have come to me and asked to do something. A lot of your weight gain. So this is... Uh, what's happening? How do I know a man has low testosterone? Low libido, loss of interest, yes, in you too. Grumpy, antisocial, indecisive. Now, I know some of you think I just phoned home, man, I've spoken to your husband. You're all sitting there going, that's him. <laughs> Have you met my husband? Procrastinate, depression, anxiety, poor erection. This is what happens to a man. He loses his will to live. So, it is an interesting thing, hey? And you thought it's, it's not because you don't, can't have sex anymore. Because a lot of men, you kind of have that feeling about men. He always wants it. It's more important than life and breathing. And all of that is true. But it's not the sex that's the problem. It's the testosterone that's the problem. That's what he actually needs. And when he has sex with you, his testosterone goes up. And when his testosterone is up, he feels like Superman. And that's what he actually wants to feel like. He doesn't actually want sex at all. Okay, that's... <laughs> Just in case people are listening, that's not entirely true. I'm looking... I'm just looking at our editing staff. <clears throat> okay. This is unfortunately what happens to a lot of women. You have this feeling as your testosterone starts to go away, like, didn't we do it last month? And this is how I know a woman's testosterone is low. I don't feel like it. You also have depression. You also have anxiety, stress. The park, the traffic to work is stressing you. You can't, what your boss said about you on Monday is still affecting you on Wednesday. You can't leave work because you never feel like your work is done. You become so efficient, you become inefficient. You're such a perfectionist, you, you're bad at what you're doing. You don't get things done or finished or started. And uh, specifically, so testosterone makes women feel amazing. Just alive. And, this is how I normally sell a lot of it, helps you to lose weight. So, I, I do a lot of testosterone implants. So, testosterone can be given in the form of an injection, a tablet, a cream, or an, a thing called an implant. Some of you in this very room might have them. So, an implant is tiny. It looks like a grain of rice. It goes into the top of your bum or in your tummy. And it sits there for six months and slowly just seeps into your system and makes you feel alive again. Uh, this, is, this is wondrous treatment. I think giving people testosterone has been one of the biggest changes in my practice in the last two or three years. Because it's always that lady that comes to you is always tired, can't function. She's on three antidepressants but still not happy. That woman does amazing on testosterone. When you go on a pill, a contraceptive pill, a hormone replacement pill, the first thing that goes down is your testosterone. And that's why a lot of women, a common complaint, contraceptives is low libido. And so much so that there is a group who believe that the reason for the high divorce rate in the last generation is because of the contraceptive pill. 
because the girls don't feel like it anymore. We're so obsessed with not having children that we actually, well, actually, it's what an effective pill if it not only takes your ovulation away, but it takes your sexual desire away. What a brilliant way to stop you having children. And we've been injecting these things for years as well. Three-month injection, two-month injection, Mirena, devices that stay inside of you for five years that essentially trick your body into thinking you're pregnant for five years. Do you think it's good to be pregnant for five years? Anybody? Anybody? You're right. No. So what happens is your body stays in, menop uh, in, pregnancy, in pregnancy and eventually it just gives up and it goes into menopause. And then you normally see me. You're depressed, your hair's falling out, your thyroid's not working, your bowels aren't working, you're fat, you feel frumpy, ugly, you, you just don't like anything anymore. Just because of the, the hormones, just because you didn't want to have children. I think the Catholics with 10 children were the happiest people in the world. <laughs> what else do you want to know? Mm, the ladies, loss of libido, loss of interest, loss of... Oh, look at the time. Uh, nights, sorry, I've been looking at the clock at the back, which says I'm only seven minutes late. <clears throat> which is an allowable time. Night sweats, body aches, pain, severe fatigue, fibromyalgia. If you know people, body aches and pains, chronic fatigue, depression. We all know these people. I fix them with testosterone. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> Good question. That's a, got a long answer, but we absolutely, we know that the levels of testosterone in our generation is probably half what it was 100 years ago because we don't exercise, because we don't fight, we don't box, we don't uh, hit swords, there's no warfare. Uh, there, you know, here's the problem with life. There's no reason for men to exist anymore. There are very few things that we can't, that you can't do, that we can. You can freeze our sperm and be done with us. We could turn into a colony of prey mantises that eat the male. Because that's all we essentially are, sperm donors. But we need stimulation. That's why sex has become a big industry because it's the only place that there's that little thing. Why do you think millions of rands are spent on soccer and on rugby? Because it's our warfare. It's the only place we get that kick anymore. Why do men drink and watch rugby in Formula One? Why do women not care? Because there's something about the missing element of life. Why are men obsessed with sex? It's the only time they get that little kick that reminds them that, that they men, where their testosterone can go up again. So we live in a very sad time. And as a result, and they've actually shown in a Japanese study, that men who help their wives in the home cook, clean, and change the, the baby's nappies drop their testosterone even further. So men are becoming women. And I don't have to tell you that. You know it. Yeah. And women are becoming <coughs> men. So we're living in a fantastic period where women don't have periods anymore because they've got morenas, they're all grumpy, and they don't need sex. Men are a bunch of wusses. Can't make decisions, can't lead, can't guide. Bad fathers, bad husbands, divorce. Two times, three times, four times. Date younger woman. Why? The kick, the kick, the kick. We just, it's, there's no, we need to punch each other. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there. Thank you very much. I think you've learned enough for one night. Come and see me. Tell all your friends. Join us on Facebook. Last week is last week. The, next week is the last week. Last week is the next week. Is that true? Is it possible? Could it finally have come? Bring everybody you know. We'll hand out prizes. There'll be champagne on your way home when you buy it yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here tonight, everybody, and letting me keep you late. <laughs>